welcome to the 27th episode of the Drive Podcast. I am Kyle Fry, of course, joined by joined as always by Jared Paolo. Uh, things happened while we were gone. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Uh, so Jordan Matthews is no longer an Eagle. Uh, Ronald Darby is. Yes. Uh, Phillies fans are freaking out about Od- Odubel Herrera, but that always happens. So yeah. that's not even... That's not, really that's not news. even news at this point. Yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh... Eagles have played a preseason game, so football season is officially back. Uh, we'll just get right into that. Uh, they lost 24-9 to the Packers. Can we talk about Matt Collins' stiff arm? Because Man, that's all I even care that about. Was, <laughs> that was something. You know, that literally is what I bet you drove like the Eagles to like finalize that deal. Because like there were oh yeah, I'm... there were reports um, that I saw. I forget who it was from. I, don't quote me on it, but I might have seen it from... Um, Adam Kaplan from ESPN. I, I'm not exactly sure, but basically the Eagles and the Bills were trying to um, work out a Jordan Matthews deal since I want to say May it said, which Jesus is crazy. I think probably you know draft dra- around draft time because yeah probably the Bills probably wanted to get picks in this draft um, with how deep it was. So, um, but yeah. I, I don't know. It caught everybody by surprise because there were no reports that the Eagles wanted to trade him, um, and there were no reports about anything. Really, it's like it just, it just hit everyone by just complete surprise. And like you said, I think that that Matt Collins stiff arm calls Jame at his job. Yep. Like hands down, because mm-hmm. as soon as the Eagles saw that, they were like, "Huh." Maybe it's okay if we don't have Jordan Matthews. <laughs> and yeah, I, I mean, I, I like honestly, concerned the fact that they got back a like I'm not gonna pretend to know that much about Ronald Darby because I just I don't understand how people track football stats like advanced stats because there seems to be like none except for like pro football focus, but like football that's just outsiders one source is decent. and yeah, football yeah. outsiders is decent, but, but yeah, it's but, yeah. The, Football's weird because like would there's think for football there's like no like advanced stats. More, but... Yeah, like there's like yeah. no advanced stats for football, and you figure that's probably the one sport where like the most happens on any given you know like play. Because like you exactly. figure baseball, it's it's baseball is hands down the sport with the most uh, advanced stats. It just is. Um, yeah, definitely. And you figure that's probably the one sport where the least amount happens on on a play because you figure it's one pitch at a time like how much can you truly generate from one pitch or one you know swing of the bat um you know like tracking down a fly ball obviously um baseball is easier to track because they play every day well most days so it's like a kind of a long term you know like consistency thing but still i mean it's it's crazy how like the nfl and or how the nfl doesn't really have any like I mean, they have advanced metrics, but it's not really as in the in the easily know. accessible. Yeah, like that's yeah. They're kind of weird with them. Like it's like yeah, like you said, Pro Football Focus, and then Football Outsiders is pretty good. But other than that, like there's nothing. Like for baseball, you have you know fan graphs. Um, baseball Reference has a ton of stuff. You have uh, like Brooks Baseball, who does like for pitching and hitting and like zone measurements. There, like it's yeah, it's just, it's just really weird how football doesn't have it when you know, so much happens on any given play, so. And also, it's, like, the most popular sport. Uh-huh. Like, that's that, that's what I'm confused about. Like, football is so popular and watched by so many people, and yet there's not someone who's been like, you know what, I really need to come up with some stuff here. Like, obviously there have been, like, there's advanced stats out there, but it's just not many. <laughs> like, yeah. it's just, it's so hard to find them, but. Yeah, so Ronald Darby, uh, he's an eagle now. Everything that I've read about him is just like the Eagles got a steal here, and that he's you know they basically fleece Buffalo. Yeah, I mean he's twenty three, and he's been he's been a really his what his I think two interceptions the last two years combined, not not each. Um, he has two interceptions, and I believe he has like fifty something defensive or def- deflected passes. So he's been basically like around the numbers of a of like a top cornerback, and hopefully. This means that we don't have to watch. This hopefully this means we don't have to watch Patrick Robinson an entire year. Yeah. <laughs> so now you figure we'll have Mills and Darby 
as our two starters at corner. Um, and then... Douglas as a nickel, uh, probably? Douglas, Douglas he... as a nickel, yeah. And you got to figure, once Sidney Jones comes back healthy, um, we could be looking at a pretty, a pretty uh, dominant backfield in the in, on defense because you figure Russell Douglas he probably would have gone much higher if it weren't for like a small injury concern. Same with Sidney Jones. Sidney Jones was a top. A first round talent pick, yeah. and he dropped all the way to what, what was it like forty or something? We got him, and something like that. Um, you figure those two guys, along with Jalen Mills, who was our sixth round pick two years ago, and has you know he he's impressed, like he's he he's done you know a lot better than a lot of people thought. So you figure with those with those three, um, or with those four, um, including you know Darby. Um, plus, obviously, Malcolm Jenkins in the at safety, um, and the rest of our defense. You know, our D lines, our, our D lines, really good. The depth is really good. Same at linebacker. Um, you know, in next year, in 2018, 19, like that season, once you get you know Sidney Jones back, uh, when you get you know chemistry between our corners and our safeties, um, and especially with how young they are, like Jordan Matt or I was about to say Jordan Matthews. Um, <laughs> Malcolm Jenkins is like our oldest defensive back, and he's twenty nine. So it's he it's gonna be like it's gonna be looking up in a couple years here, especially if you know the the offense can can click this year. Um, I mean, it kind of did already. Which Carson Wentz looked fantastic. Yeah, yeah he did. He looked. Yeah. Um, but we but also just to mention because uh, I, I don't think we did the uh, the Eagles also sent a twenty eighteen third round pick in the deal so um and if you're freaking out about that uh we have three fourth round picks to work with so I, i'm sure howie roseman will find a, it's, it's howie roseman in draft picks <laughs> he's gonna find a way to get back in somewhere so uh yeah. if not trade you know a, a whatever a fourth for like two fifths and then yeah you know you know how high roseman works but um but yeah so and one and one kind of final thing about the uh, the Matthews deal before we talk about, um, you know the the preseason game, um, it, it it was tough. It was going to be tough to re-sign Matthews anyway because you figure he probably is going to have the salary demands beyond this year, by the way, because he his contract only runs through this year. Um, he's probably going to have the salary demands of you know pro- I, I, at least in my guesses and from a lot of people that I've seen somewhere between like nine and 10, maybe 11 million, which is a, a lot of, I mean, you got to figure Alshon Jeffrey's making what 15 million this year. And he's like, when healthy, a probably top 10 receiver, if not close to it in the league. Um, so yeah, it would, it would just be really tough to resign him on, you know, good terms for both the Eagles and him. So, as much as it sucks yeah. that you know Carson Wentz loses a guy who's he, who he's really close with, um, it is a business. You know you, you gotta make ends meet where you where you can make them, and then kind of just go from there. So I, I'm personally I'm I'm a fan of the deal. I'm I'm really high on Darby. He's only 23. He has played. He made the All Rookie Team in 2015. He's he's gonna be a stud. Yeah, and they address a need. I mean that's what yep. the whole basis of this deal was. He was address a need. They gave up a depth receiver, and, like, we all like Jordan Matthews, but I'd realistically, what was he going to be for the team long-term? A $10 million slot receiver? That doesn't make sense. No. That's just... You don't do that. Your slot receiver ends up being Mac Collins, probably, and I'm perfectly fine with that if he keeps on stiff-arming people like he did (laughs) against the Packers. So, uh, the Eagles won the trade, in my opinion. We'll see what happens. Uh... Obviously, football is so weird. Like, players can be elite one day and then they'd be complete trash the next day. Mm-hmm. It it's so hard to ever get a really consistent player. Uh, but like you said, Darby's only twenty three. He's gonna keep growing, uh, and that's the same thing for basically all of our cornerbacks. Sidney Jones is obviously young; just got drafted. Mills is young. Douglas is young. It's if they all, you know, amount to what we project them to be it's going to be a really good secondary for a while like this is 
something that they can keep together for a long time. Oh, absolutely. Because you figure, um, Darby is 23, Cindy Jones is 21, um, Russell Douglas, I believe, is also 21. Yeah, Russell Douglas is also 21, and then Jalen Mills is 23. So you figure that if all four of those guys pan out to what they could be, um, which obviously, you know, it's not it's not very likely because it, something is going to happen more than likely where one of them doesn't, and that's fine because then you have, you know, less of a log jam, and you could, you know, address other, address other needs. Um... But you see what happens when you have a bunch of good, um, you know, defensive backs for multiple years. I mean, just look at Seattle. So, yeah, yeah, it, Seattle wouldn't be where they are today if it wasn't for having just like a really consistent secondary for how many years now? Exactly. Um, so yeah, I you just you really just have to kind of commend the Eagles for making the move and uh, addressing the need. So it, you. Now you have two 23-year-olds and two 21-year-olds who are all going to be, you know, or who are all, you know, extremely talented, have pretty high ceilings, um, and are all going to be, you know, learning the game, learning the league, developing together. And and that's probably all you could wish for, especially when you have a young quarterback. Um, you have, a you know, most, most pieces in place to be a successful team, and now you just kind of need your... So like some few, a few positions to uh, to kind of come together, and uh, then you pretty much just make a run at it, and uh, hopefully the Eagles will be able to do that. Um, if not next year, hopefully. I mean, nobody's really ruling out this year because some teams surely took a step back in the uh, in the NFC, and uh, one team took a hit uh, just a couple of days ago. But uh, <laughs> that. But anyway. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean it. it it's gonna hopefully. I, you really just gotta hope that. Um, also, by the way, just for Jordan Matthews, like suffered a, a chest injury today in his first day of practice with the Bills. So <laughs> that's oh, that figures. Yeah, that just that, that's the most Buffalo Bills thing to ever happen. Mm -hmm. Like the Bills are just such a screwed franchise. But yeah. hopefully, it's not that serious, and you can actually produce, considering the fact that the Bills just gave away Sammy Watkins, which, what the fuck are the Bills doing? I'm not uh, sure. Yeah, they, EJ, what was it, EJ Reigns they got for him? Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> and they're trying to run Tyrod Taylor out of town. Like, I, I don't understand what Buffalo's doing. Yeah. But, uh, so Carson Wentz went 4-for-4, four four, threw a touchdown. Uh, he looked as poised as could possibly be possibly be and the Packers were blitzing like every single play mm -hmm. like that was ridiculous oh yeah I can't believe how many and okay was it just me or was, were they off sides like every single time they, they got like, called they were over the line they only got called <laughs> what once or twice I think but they were like off sides but they were clearly a good three or yeah, yeah I mean it was I bad. mean unless it's unless the the video producers of the lines were in preseason mode too then I don't know but yeah I yeah, like, I remember the one offside. play of, like, the defensive lineman was way over the line of yeah. scrimmage, and they're just like, eh, it's fine. Yeah, and it only got, I think they only got called but, uh, for maybe once or twice. <laughs> I know one, I remember one, like, for sure they got called on, but I don't remember yeah. many other ones. Preseason shenanigans. Yep. But, uh, <laughs> so once Carson Wentz came out of the game, Matt McGloin threw the ball 42 times. <laughs> They, uh, <laughs> the Eagles couldn't do anything on the on the on the ground. Yeah, Corey Clement had the most carries, and he rushed for 13 yards on seven mm -hmm. attempts. Uh, it yeah. was Legarrette Blount was used like pretty poorly. Like he was going to the outside most of the time, which didn't make a, any bit of sense. Uh, Pumphrey was bad. Like Pumphrey looked horrible in the, in the run and on punt returns. Uh, yeah. There wasn't that much to talk about with the rushing game. It was pretty bad. Yeah, it was but. basically non-existent. I mean, it, it's it's kind of to be expected, I guess, because it's, you know, the first preseason game. Um, you have your offensive line who, I mean, for the most part last season, didn't really get many reps together because of uh, injuries, obviously, and because of Lane Johnson's suspension. So they're going to... As the preseason goes on, hopefully they can regain some of their uh, 
some of their chemistry back. Um, you know, plus well, Garrett Blunt wasn't really used. I don't think. I I I want to say he was. Uh, he ran what maybe a handful of times. It was four times for nine yards. Yeah. So yeah. it you know it as the preseason goes on, then you could start worrying more if if it doesn't improve. But I think as of now, it's it's kind of just you know get the get the first game out of the way. Um, basically, basically the preseason in the NFL works like this: get the first two preseason games out of the way, you know, get get your reps here and there. Don't get injured. Third preseason game comes around. That's when you you know you go ninety percent, eighty percent of you know give give buddy eighty nine percent effort and um, play three quarters and then just sit the fourth preseason game and then be ready for the season. So um, yeah, and even like the coaching, like the play calling like it was in just ex- like experimental mode because mm-hmm. they were going for it on fourth down all the time they weren't like this isn't this isn't the type of system you're going to see on opening day no. like this was just we're trying things out and let's just see what works yeah like and they literally what said it? what they were going to run like the eagles coaching set like the offensive coordinator said before the game he told reporters like literally what they were going to run like he, yeah. they, like, there were, <laughs> like there were like there were like there were I think, like, four or five beat reporters who tweeted out, like, um, our, the Eagles offensive coordinator told us that uh, they're going to try, you know, this play. And I think they ran it. It was the play, I think it was a jet sweep for Aguilar. Or it was either that or yeah. a different play. One of the two. It was, but, yeah, they basically told, I mean, it's it's kind of just pretty, there, it's really, yeah, just like experimental mode. Um, just kind of testing out new stuff, testing players, certain spots here and there. But, you know, it, it was pretty a much. Game. Yeah, I mean, it's the first pre- preseason game. Like we said last week, don't get... Don't draw too many conclusions from it, positive or negative. Like, Bryce Strikes had seven catches for 91 yards, but they also threw the ball 42 times. Yeah. So, <laughs> like, just by nature, someone's going to get a decent stat line. So, mm-hmm. it's just, it's whatever. Like, first preseason game, you're, you're just kind of... Like, the main goal of this game was no one get hurt. Like, no one of the starters get hurt. Which didn't happen. Everyone was pretty much healthy. Uh, Wentz looked good in the limited time that we saw him in, and that's about it. Like it's there's not much else to say. But oh, uh, actually, Derek Barnett had two sacks, so that yes. was. I mean, very nice to see. Granted, it was against like <laughs> second-ish stringers, but still, yeah. I mean, yeah. Off the line, he did the, the things uh, that the made him great record. in college. Yeah, yeah. It was, I. The one sack that he had where he just, like, it was literally every single one of his sacks from college. Like, he just bull rushed to the outside, and the the offensive lineman had nothing for him. Yeah. There was just no way of stopping him. Pretty much, yeah. He, uh, he came in, he got limited reps um, with the first team um, to, like, start the game. Uh, but then once, you know, once Fletcher and, and Brandon Graham and all them... Once they sat after basically the first c- c- few quarters, um, he played a lot more. And he looked, he looked good against. Uh, like I said, granted, it, they were you know second stringers, some third stringers, but but still, I mean, they're the NFL players, so um, it's still impressive yeah, in a way. Yeah, yeah, and I think once you know once he gets his his um, once he gets his uh, like his chemistry in with with the other. Um, line linemen and and linebackers, um, yeah, he'll be fine because that his outside move is just that good to where, sure, you know, NFL uh, offensive linemen are going to stop him a lot, probably more often than not. Um, but it with you know when you have Fletcher Cox, Brandon Graham, Vinny Curry, um, Cliff Jernigan, all these guys, Chris Long, all these guys, you know, along on your side, you're gonna you know get your you're gonna get your reps. You're gonna get your your sacks, your tackles, your hits, pressures, everything. So, yeah, I, yeah, pretty impressed with Derek Barnett in that first game for sure. <clears throat> yeah, hope. I mean, I'm sure in the second game we'll see him get more yeah, reps probably. against like the first team, and especially in the third game, obviously. But yeah, but yeah, it was still good to see. Um, just a few last things on the Eagles. Uh, some jersey number updates. Uh, Darby wears number 35. Uh, Blunt got his number 29 back. And, uh, fuck, I forget his first name. Terrence. Oh, yeah, Terrence Brooks. So Terrence Brooks gets a number 24. So, uh, 
So you're Ryan Matthews. Ryan Matthews is gone. <laughs> yeah. He's... I don't know what the deal is with, like, how long it's taking them to actually just, like, finalize it, but... Well, they just have to wait for this. Is he still... Though, pretty much, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. That, yeah I keep forgetting that, like, he's point. waiting on that. But. Yeah. So long as he's... Yeah, so... Once he passes that, it'll be... He'll be gone, so... Probably, probably not too yeah, much longer. So Ryan Matthews... I mean, eh, it's good. We got Blanc now, so hopefully he can be what is expected, and then we obviously have Pumphrey and Sproul, so... Yep. It'll be interesting to see how running back works out this year, but that is pretty much it for the Eagles, unless you have anything else to add. No, yeah, just that... Uh, the uh, the next preseason game is the 17th uh, against the Bills, so... Oh, know. that's interesting. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hi, Jordan Matthews. So yeah, we'll get to see... see. Uh, yeah, we, we might get to see Jordan Matthews, assuming that... Um, his chest injury isn't isn't too serious, so yeah. And we get to see EJ Gaines, Reigns, whatever the hell his name is. Yep. The apparently star cornerback of the LA Rams, who is now a Buffalo, Buffalo Bill. Bill. Yep. <laughs> oh man, football teams are so weird. Oh yeah. Uh, all right. So Phillies. Before we even get into any of the hot streaks, because there was a lot. There are a lot of players there are a lot that of we. Players. Yeah, we're doing pretty freaking well. Uh, let's just address what happened today. So, bases were loaded for Nick Williams. He hits a fly ball to not shallow center field, despite what you may have read on Twitter. Yeah, it was not shallow. Nope. It was pretty like it like like Jared said in a text to me. He's like, "That's warning track if it's to left or right." So it's not shallow, but uh. Freddie Galvis doesn't tag. Watson Ball doesn't send him. Whatever the. Well, who, whoever call it was there, like if Sammy told him to stay or Freddie was just like, nah, I'm not going to go. Freddie doesn't tag. Oduble, I don't know what the hell happened because I swear like it looks like he looks at Freddie and sees him there well, and then just decides, I'm going to run. Yeah. So like what? <laughs> like he sees the ball gets away. Yeah. So then... like what happened? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the <laughs> throw, Michael Conforto, who was playing center for the Mets, he threw it home, obviously. And the throw, like, it looked like it got away from the Mets catcher, who's Travis Darno. Um, but it it it, it kind of did, but it, in the same sense it didn't. It only trickled maybe a few inches to a foot away from him. And then Oduble thought that it had gotten away. And so he took off for third, thinking that Freddie Galvis thought, or thinking that Freddie Galvis had run home. Because he thought it, it got away. But it, it didn't. So Oduble ended up running to third where Galvis was. And then, then he got tagged out. So, uh, I mean, yeah. it's tough to place. Like, I looked at it a few times. Obviously, they showed it. The replay of it on the broadcast. And, you know, you probably saw it on Twitter as well. But um, it's tough to play. the. It, it's a really weird situation. Because Oduble's kind of mishap doesn't happen if the first situation doesn't happen, right? So, you, ha you have to ask yourself, okay, who's the blame on? Is it, was Freddie, you know, in this, was, did Freddie make the decision to not go home or did Juan Samuel not send him? You have to ask that question. Um, and then, after that, you have to ask, okay, so based on, you know, that scenario, like the first scenario that Freddie Galvis just didn't tag up on the ball for whatever reason, or on the fly ball for whatever reason, did, you know, did he, or is Oduble in the, in the wrong for um, for going when he thought the ball was passed? It, it's just a weird situation. Like, you, you have to, you have to kind of break it down into two parts because it was kind of two different plays, but the second play where Oduble gets tagged out doesn't happen if, Freddie Galvis and or Juan Samuel makes the right play in the first place. So, yeah. Yeah. And, like, I get you could probably argue, like, oh, should you have sent Freddie? I don't see how he doesn't score on that. I mean, like, it's Freddie. There's just no yeah, way. He, he's fast. Like, it's not like you're, you're, we're talking about, yeah. like, Reese, or, like Tommy, Tommy Joseph here or something, or Cam Rock. Yeah. Like, it's Freddie. Yeah. Freddie's not the fastest dude in the world, but he's fast enough to score on that. And especially when it was, like, it was a bad throw. Like, it was off the plate. Yeah. Like, it bounced to Darno, and, it, like, it, par like you said, partially got away. But regardless, it's still a bad throw. Like, it took him way out of the 
like the baseline. It took him like way past the plate. Like Freddie's gonna score on that just because of that bad throw alone. So I just I don't get it. Like yeah, Odubel's gotta be more aware. But the play again that doesn't happen if Samuel or Freddie just like Samuel just tells him to tag or Freddie just tags. Yeah, I just. It's it's the fact that people just completely ignored the fact that Freddie should have gone, and they were just blaming Odubel. That that's what pissed me off about it because you can yeah. call out Odubel for you know getting himself into that situation, but also call out the fact that it doesn't become a situation if Freddie just fucking tags. Yeah. So basically, yeah, it just gives the Odubel haters more fuel, and even though, and we're gonna get in now to one of the hot streaks. Uh, so Odubel Herrera, since, let me check, since June 1st, since June 1st, he is, or, or since June 3rd, well, Same thing. Whatever, he, has, he didn't play that he played in second. June. Yeah. Yeah. So he's batting 340, has an OBP of 382, 579 slug, and nine home runs, 31 RBIs. 23 doubles. And he hit 23 doubles, three triples. He's gonna and he's on a 16-game hitting streak at the moment. Yeah, he's going to lead the but National the League in double. He's literally going to lead the National League in doubles. Like, I think he's tied yeah, he's right like... now with... Um, let me just double check <clears throat> that right now. But I'm pretty sure... Because I, I know as of yesterday, I believe, he was tied with... Um, he was tied with Daniel Murphy, I believe. Okay, no. Oh, well, actually, no. Hang on. I'm not, I'm not even on. Okay. Here we go. Um, let me see. He is... Uh, if this would load, that would be fantastic. Okay, here we go. Yeah, he's tied with Daniel Murphy, um, in the NL, and he is tied for third with Murphy in all of baseball behind Jed Lowry and, who is this, Jose Ramirez, I believe. Yeah, Jed Lowry of yeah. the Athletics and then Jose Ramirez of the Indians. So, uh, yeah, I mean... He's, hopefully he, at, at least, if, if he just leads the NL in doubles, that's fine. Um, I mean, the MLB wouldn't be a bad, he could, wouldn't be a bad rap yeah. either, but, yeah, still, I mean, he's, he's doing, I mean, he, he has two less games played than, than Ramirez, so maybe he hits two doubles. Um, but yeah, I mean, he's, he's having a really good year after, after a bad month, so, uh, yeah. I, yeah, after like one of the worst months that I've ever seen. Oh yeah, from like it's crazy, like how hot he's been, player. and his you know averages. I, mean, I say only, but it's only a two eighty six, and his OBP is only a three thirty two. Like he, you know, he other than May, if he, if he, I'm not to say you know he would have been this hot in May, but if he had you know the the May that his he had, April, if he basically. had his April in May, yeah, and uh, if he, yeah, basically if he doubled his April. And hit you know like two seventy or whatever. Um, you know, kept his on base <laughs> around three forty, three fifty. He would probably be above three hundred right now, and his on base would probably be somewhere around three fifty. So, I it's gonna be it's gonna be fun to watch him play out the rest of the season for sure. Um, because he's he might he's be a, a twenty home run guy if he had. <laughs> he could be. He could be for sure. He, he his power is starting to come around like that. When he golfed out the other day somehow, so, um, yeah, I mean, it, yeah, I still don't know how he hit yeah, that. Yeah, no idea. Hit that out. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not really too sure. But uh, but yeah, I mean, he, he's yeah. gonna be fun to watch the rest of the year, and I I really 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 do hope that the people who are you know hating on him for whatever reason, um. I mean, I, I, I understand, like, where you're kind of coming from in the sense that some people just can't kind of grasp, like, the new baseball kind of, like, style, I guess. And, like, I, I, I'm, don't get me wrong. Like, I, I, I kind of get it. But in the same sense, like, I don't care about it, so, like, I, I don't get it in the same sense. Um, but... I, I get what you mean. Yeah, like, I just hope, like, for those reasons, like, you could just see, like, through that... And say, okay, I won't pay attention, you know, when he bat flips or when he makes, like, a mental error in the field or on the bases or whatever. Which, I, which you know, the, the latter two in the field and on base, that's that's a different story than bat flipping. Because, you know, it's bat flipping and against, you know, an error in the field or a base running error. Um, but just, just see through it and, like, 
look, like, the dude is, he's second in the league in doubles. And he's, you know, hitting, like, 400 in the last, like, month. 340 in the last, like, month and a half. Or two months, two and a half months, so. I don't know. It, it's just, it just sucks to see, like, a lot of people who are, you know, not, you know, appreciating him for what he is. Which, it, it sucks, but, you know, it happens. Yeah. It's like, Phillies have a bad team, we want good players, we get a good player, we try to run him out of town because he bad flips yeah. and has a few mental mistakes. Yep. Like, it's just, it's so hypocritical, which, it, it, it doesn't surprise me because that's just how, a, sadly, a decent amount of Phillies fans are, but it's just, and like, to your point about, you know, people being unaware of, like, the new kind of style of baseball... It is perfectly fine to still love players like Chase Utley. Oh, absolutely. Like, I, I will love Chase Utley for the rest of my goddamn life. Like he is. You got ejected last night. My. Think? Yeah, that was complete bullshit. Yeah, the umpires was... in this league oh, need to. Oh my a... god, yeah. We just need to fire everyone. Get like. Yeah, all just... new umps. They, I, I just don't understand. Like a simple request to move out of the way mm -hmm. of a player who actually is playing the game. Yep. Anyway, fuck, fuck MLB umpires. Um. It's just, like, you're fine to still love Chase Utley. Like, no one's gonna think that you're crazy for doing that. But quit being so offended by bat flips. Yeah. Like, of all the things going on in the world today, bat flips are the least thing to be offended yeah, by. seriously. <laughs> like, get a reality check, please. Yeah, like, we just had, <laughs> it's not, we just had, like, a couple hundred, like, Nazis march through a town in you know, Virginia. Like, the... And people defend it. Yeah. Like, <laughs> people going, like... I mean, there were, like, 12 <laughs> people that defended it, but, like, still, I mean... Yeah it's, yeah, it's the fact that you have people who are, like... Like, someone can say, punch a Nazi, and someone's just like, well, actually... Yeah, like, I mean... no, punch Nazis. Yeah, like, so I've heard who tweeted <laughs> it, but it was... It was either a former <coughs> senator... Or, it might have... Actually, it might have even been Bill Clinton, to be honest with you. I think that's who it was. But, like, he, he said, like... You know, obviously, while, like, while you are protecting free speech, because... I, like you don't nobody like the the large majority does not agree with anything that those people were you know protesting right but you still want to like protect them because like they have the right to do it that's what this country was built on right but yeah. still you as long as it's peaceful but still, protest, but still, then it's but still like screw that opinion and like I'm I'm gonna like fight that till forever right so. But so, yeah. It, yeah, that was, yeah. Uh, I, I don't need it, but yeah. Just, again, theme is punch Nazis. Anyway, <laughs> uh, yeah, Odubel's easily been the best player over the past two and a half months, so just chill the fuck out about his bad flips and his mental mistakes. Like, he'll, it's not going to be a big deal when the team's winning, like, 90 games a season. Yeah, but if you're really it's coming. Like... Exactly. And, fuck, I think it was a... Uh, John, uh, John Stolness from The Good Fight, who mentioned, like, he didn't go through AAA. Like, he went straight from AA to the MLB because of the Rule 5 draft. Yep. This isn't a guy who had to go through people like, uh, our AAA manager, I forget his name, like, Dusty Wathen yep. or something like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. He didn't have to go through him, <laughs> who would have yeah, he would have given would've... him so oh, many yeah. benchings. Like, it sucks, because if yeah. he were to, if Odubel were to have, um, been like with you know Redding and now with with Lehigh when when Wathan is there Wathan Harvey pronounced is there like look what look what Wathan did to Nick Williams like Nick Williams last season when um who was even their manager I forget like Jeff something or whatever I, he was trash anyway um when like you look at what Nick Williams was under was like under him right and he you know he would have he would get benched a few times because of like a lack of hustle or lack of, you know, awareness in the field. Um, and now you look at this year and you see, you know, Williams having his highest home to first times of his career. Um, you see him hustling. Literally, he, I, I guarantee you, if you went back and watched every single one of Nick Williams' at-bats, you probably don't see a single ball where he doesn't hustle. Like, like it's, it's yeah, crazy. He's, and he's not even, like, it's not even just the hustling. He's just become a really good base runner. Yeah. Like, he's one of the best already on the team, and he's in his rookie season, and he's only had, like, 40-some games, I think. 
basically in his major league career. Pretty much, yeah. It's insane. Yeah, they're 41. They're and as much 41st. as we all, like, and as much as we all shat on, like, uh, Wathen last year when he was being a complete dick to Williams, it, it obviously helped. Like, he obviously has gotten, like, better awareness from mm-hmm. it, so it's... I don't know, it's tough. You hate seeing people get benched for over, like, silly things, but sometimes they just need that as a wake-up call, and then their overall game improves. So. Yep. Yeah, but, plus, uh, just kind of just, like, just talk about Nick Williams, like, for another, like, two seconds here. He's He's been, <laughs> his approach has been a lot better, for sure, because he walked Ooh, twice yeah. yesterday, walked again today, got hit by a pitch. He's gotten hit by a pitch or walked, um... <laughs> He's well. He's gotten on by hit by pitch or walks like five times in the last like five games. So that's pretty. Uh, that, that I I guess that's good. I mean, he's, his approach is a yeah, lot it, better, <laughs> and uh, his on base is higher in the MLB than it was in AAA, which is a really good sign because then you have hope for guys yeah. like uh, like Alfaro who is doing well in his four starts or whatever it is, but. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely good to see. It's having a higher OBP in the majors than in AAA is hard for, especially for a guy like Williams, who you never really praised for. Yeah, played and it's not really mentioned much because, or it's not really mentioned much, but a a major league strike zone helps a can help a player's you know played a played approach a ton, and even for how much you know you kind of you you know shit on MLB umpires. They're still their their strike zones are still a lot better than you know minor league Triple umpires <laughs> and everything. So yeah, yeah. I mean it helps. Yeah. I've been watching a lot of Iron Pigs games lately just because man, it is. I'll, I'm gonna get to him in a little bit, but it's so fun watching JP Crawford at bats. Like that dude has the that dude is Chase Utley in the minor leagues. Yeah, like in terms of plate vision, it, it is spot on how Chase goes about his at-bats, and I've noticed that more and more just from watching him. It's it's fucking insane. Yeah. But, uh, before we get into JP, Aaron Nola has been the best pitcher in baseball I literally. think over his last ten starts. Like, literally, yeah. It's... Holy shit. So, his last ten starts, 7-3 and three record, 1.71 ERA. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm laughing at saying that. A 196 batting average against, 253... OBP against. Yeah, it's. <laughs> and a 312 slug against. This dude is. I. This dude is like Roy Halladay Prime, like what we're seeing right now. Like, he is just he is absolute fire. Insane. Yeah, 68 and a third in, seven, er, in 10 starts. So you figure basically seven innings a start. And, um. Yeah, I. <laughs> the guy has just been insane. He has a 66% strike percentage. Um, 19 walks, only 78 strikeouts. He's only given up five home runs. I mean, you really can't ask much, much more from the guy. I mean, he's just, he's been insane the last 10 starts. And, um, I, I believe it was, um, if I could find it here really quickly, uh, Ryan Lawrence from, uh, Philly Inquirer. Let me just, uh, pull up his article. He did a, uh, an article on, how Aaron Nola's numbers stack up against um, how they stack up Cole against spins. yeah Cole Hamels and um, bro like every time every time we <laughs> every record, time. my phone doesn't ring any it never rings now it records and, and when we record it it, it rings um, anyway um, they he did a piece on um. Yeah, how he stacked up against Cole and a, a few other people. I, 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 know, I know Garrett Cole was in there. Um, Sonny Gray. Uh, I can't find... I, 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 I can, what, is it not? Like, is it, is it down <laughs> or something? I can't find it. But um, here we go. So yeah, so Ryan Lawrence on the Philly Voice. Um, one of the better writers on the Philly Voice, must I say. Because, wow, a lot of them are bad. Um, yeah. Yeah, so since the All-Star break, he has a better ERA than Bumgarner, Scherzer, DeGrom, Kluber, and many others. Um, so his ERA, which during his nine-game run since July 22nd, uh, 1.76. I, I'm not sure. Does this 
does this uh does this game log Okay, so now it's a ten game start. So this this was before even yesterday's start. Um one point seven six was his ERA going into yesterday and his last so he lowered it somehow. I don't know. Anyway. Somehow. Um so yeah, two oh seven, two sixty two, so he lowered that too. Um yeah, he the guy's just been insane. It's lower. It's the lowest in the National League among qualified starters, um, and it, only behind Sonny Gray and Corey Kluber. And now it's lower than them. I think 1.74, 1.75. His 1.71. So yeah, he's lower than that now. Um, and against Cole Hamels, he their numbers like are insane across the board. Like how close they are. Yeah. Um, Cole had him in the win-loss, but that was because Cole came up when there was an actual offense here. Um, yeah. <laughs> Cole had only 14 more innings. Um, Hamels had less than a .2 lower ERA. Uh, he had barely lower whip. Um, Nola has a better strikeout per walk ratio. He has, they have basically the identical walk per nine um, and strikeout per nine. Nola gets up less home runs. He has a lower uh, fielder independent pitching. He has a lower ERA plus. Um, B war F war basically the same. I mean, the numbers are there are crazy across the board. So Aaron Nola is uh, basically an ace at this point. I mean, he's he's been remarkable. Yeah, remarkable. And it all goes back to something I think. I think we mentioned it last episode, but, like, the hitch in his mm -hmm. uh, leg when he delivers. Ever since then, he's been lights out. And it's it's more and more noticeable each time that I, like, watch him pitch. Because, I, like, I hadn't really paid that close attention to it before. But the, his last start uh, yesterday against the Mets, or, well, when you're listening to this, two days ago. Like, two days ago against the Mets. Uh it's so noticeable and like you can tell like it just it helps him so much and like it fools the batters a lot and just to put in perspective so over his last 10 starts he's lowered his era from a 476 to a 3.02 yeah it's insane. that's freaking insane yeah he's uh he's, he's fourth got... in the nl and era as well and eighth in the entire league which is just i no one would have expected that at this no. point <laughs> He's, again, like I said, he's basically been an ace, and this is the Aaron Nola that we were all kind of hoping we would see eventually, and hopefully, hopefully, he doesn't get hurt, yep. and he can just keep this up. And the guy's only 24. And, yeah. 24 and years old doing this. It's not like he's really going to ever blow out his arm, I think, like, knock on wood, but, like, I don't think he ever will, just because he doesn't throw hard. Like, he throws, like, 91, 92 pretty consistently. His breaking stuff he'll, is he'll just... He'll take it to 94, but yeah, like he's... Not yeah. Every once in a while, yeah. Yeah. But like, his curveball is just unhittable, basically, <clears throat> at this point. His changeup is getting to that point, which, that's the thing. His changeup, if he keeps improving that, there's no stopping him. No. Because his fastball, the movement on that is elite. The curveball, like I said, is just unhittable. If he can get the changeup working... Watch that's out. three out pitches. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Usually he's... pitchers with three out pitches are pretty good. I mean, yeah, I would they're say right. pretty good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're okay. But like honestly, like the the <laughs> NL East is gonna be really stacked. Well, mainly the Phillies and the Braves and some with the Mets, because you know, obviously they have no Syndergaard still. But like those three teams with their prospects and who they have coming up and the financial capabilities. Um, less so the Mets because they're just cheap for whatever reason. But anyway, um, like the top of the NL East pitching staffs, there is going to be there's going to be some pretty solid duels coming up in these next few years. Once you know, because Noel, like I said, he's only 24. He literally just turned 24 like two months ago. Um, then plus we have um, Kilame coming up. He's in Reading now. Dominguez, who's in Clearwater, Sixo, who's in Clearwater. All these guys are be coming up two to three years. And around that timeline is when a lot of the Braves' starting pitching prospects are, are kind of slated to come up. Plus, Noah Syndergaard is really good. Um, he's only, what, 20? I think he's 24 as well, maybe 23 even. Um, 
I think 23, but yeah. yeah it's, it's, he might have just turned 24, two. and then, um, you know, obviously they have Stephen Matz. The Nats Matz, have Scherzer. <laughs> Nats have Scherzer. Um, Strasburg. Yeah. I. Damn. It, if only... Man, Jose Fernandez, man. If only... If only, but, you know. Yeah. That's... Like, it's weird saying this, but, like, can you imagine how good the Marlins would be if they had Jose this year? Yeah, man. With the because year that Carlos Stanton's having, holy. Holy shit. He has, like, 41 home runs that already. Dude, <laughs> that dude. Okay, I'm actually curious now. Like, I just want to see what his splits are, like, by month, because he has, uh, he's, he's got to have, like, I think he has a home run in his last, like, five games or something like that. Like, he's on an insane pace. The last player Dude. to hit, he's on pace to hit around like fifty something home runs, I think. And the last player to hit, how Ryan Howard was the last player to hit the most, and it was like fifty eight back in oh whatever yeah. six or whatever it was seven. Yeah, he was. Yeah, the the closest anyone has come to Ryan is, I think it was Chris Davis who had like fifty four, mm-hmm. like twenty twelve, I think it was. Yeah, maybe somewhere around there. Like that. Yeah, twenty thirteen. But. Uh, but yeah, he's like like you said, he's basically on pace to hit Ryan's like fifty six that he or Ryan had fifty eight and 06, but fifty six or more. Uh <laughs> he he has fifteen home runs in twenty seven games in the second yeah, half. Yeah. That's that's not fair. That's just not and he's increased his OBP, he's increased his average, obviously his OPS. <laughs> yeah. Uh the dude is on Imagine the Phillies could get him because the Marlins are the Marlins and they're the cheapest franchise in the history of I baseball. I mean, there were talks, but like, imagine, it didn't happen. Yeah, I mean, who knows? It still might happen because it's the Marlins. Yeah, it's Like, true. they are notorious for trading their stars. Yeah, so. but now they're sold, so... <laughs> Maybe yeah, not. true. And it all depends. Like, it all depends on how Derek Jeter and co. whoever the fuck bought yeah. it. Bought the Marlins with him. However they run the team, but... Yeah. Giancarlo Sand is this... A, Freaking machine, and the Marlins are only five games under five hundred now. Mm. Somehow, yeah, I don't... <laughs> the Mets are in third and one game out of being fourth. But you know, they're totally in a better position than the Phillies right now. The Met, you see, the Mets are at a really weird timeline because they have some pretty good prospects in Ahmed Rosario and Dominic Smith, who just literally they literally just came up. Like Dominic Smith was promoted literally came up the yeah. day after Hoskins. <laughs> And then Rosario was promoted like a week and a half ago or a week ago or something like that. But like, who else? They don't have anybody besides those two, Syndergaard and... St- I mean, Steven Matz is good, but he's not even in the rotation two-thirds of the season because he's always injured. Uh, Matt Harvey is... He's not that great anymore. Um, Zach Wheeler, who was once like the most prized possession Biggest in all of thing. baseball. Yeah. Now he's nothing. He's, you know, whatever now. Um... And, I mean, All of a sudden, the rotation DeGrom, is basically just Degrom and Syndergaard. Basically, yeah. And I mean, while that's you know really good, it's not enough when you have, you know, an aging no catcher. When, yeah, when you have a Darno who is not, you know, that great of a catcher. Um, you know, Dominic Smith and Ahmed Rosario, they're really good. But who else do you have around him? You have Azdrubal Cabrera. You have Jose Reyes. Um, I mean, you have Cespedes, but he's getting up there in age. He's still he's he's ha- he hasn't had the greatest second half, so except against the Phillies, of course. But um, yeah. I, there's really you don't have a ton. You have Curtis Granderson, like all these guys are aging. You're you're gonna have to really hope that your farm system produces someone out of the blue because other than those two, you don't really hear much about the Mets system, and, yeah. and their owners are notorious for being cheap. So. The Mets are in a weird space right now. But. And that's the thing, like, going into the season, it was like, man, the Mets rotation, and now it's just like, mm. I mean, besides DeGrom and Syndergaard, that's basically it. There's just nothing there. Harvey, like you said, isn't that good anymore. Uh, Wheeler's just hurt all the time. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so is Harvey. Seth Lugo just isn't... I don't really know what he yeah, is. Like, he's just not... Yeah, and he's hurt. And... Like you said, just that's offense. Like what, Cespedes? Like for as feared as he can be, like when he's hot, he's only got 14 home runs this year and 36 RBIs, yeah. and he's only hitting 275, not a high mm-hmm. OBP. Like Wilmer Flores is basically their yeah top offensive threat at this point, and that's not a good sign. Yeah, it's it's a it's, 
they're definitely in. They're gonna have to. They're going to have to spend in free agency because most of their, well, pretty much their only two highly regarded prospects are are up now. So it's uh yeah. And I mean, obviously, Conforto is really good. Yeah, Conforto. I kind of forgot about him just because baseball reference doesn't have him on the in like the top thing to have him as like as like a bench player, but obviously he's not a bench player. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The Mets are kind of in disarray. Yeah, they're in, a, uh, which is awesome. Yeah, exactly. It's good for us. Mm-hmm. Amazing. <laughs> uh, speaking of the Phillies farm system, JP Crawford is on fucking fire. <laughs> so. <laughs> Yeah, I don't. Ever I don't know. since July first, he is batting a two ninety three, but his on base percentage is at a three ninety three, and he has a OPS of uh, one one point oh two eight. Uh, you could say that's pretty good. Yeah, he's that's, um, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Since uh, yeah, since July. Well, if we're gonna let's just, might as well just date it back to J- June twentieth when he came back from that little injury. But I mean, he hasn't really. There's not really much difference there, but yeah, 288. Well, yeah, Kyle yeah. just read you the, the July 1st numbers, but the June 20th, since June 20th numbers, uh, 288, 388, 582, and uh, a 969 on base or OPS, which is nice. Um, his BABIP here, let me let me do this actually. So, his BABIP, um, since June 20th is a 309. Um, so prior to that, so from June 10th, or well. From April seventh to June tenth, he was bibbing two thirty three. So that is um, Michael. I think Michael Franco's bibb is about a two thirty three. So that gives you basically the luck that J.P. Crawford was having um, when he was putting balls in play. I mean, granted, you know he still wasn't hitting the ball that all that well, and even somehow he still had like a three twenty on base percentage um, because his approach to the plate is insane, but. Yeah, since June twentieth, eleven home runs, eleven doubles, five triples, uh, twenty nine walks, thirty seven strikeouts. Well, I, including today's numbers, thirty walks, thirty eight strikeouts. Um, yeah, I mean he's he's been on fire. He has, I believe, he's on like a nine game hitting streak. Let me just count it up: one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, nine game hitting streak um, since the fifth of August, and before that, he was on a four game. Um, he's had he already has three home runs in. In, in August, he has two or three tri- uh, three doubles, a triple. I mean, he's he's really been I, like when 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 you get to mid July, right? And he was almost a month into the streak, and he was still hitting home runs, still still doubling, still tripling. You're like, all right, you know, this this will probably end here sometime soon. He's not going to be able to sustain this. But yeah, he, he literally has no, stopped. He's, he's, he's it. just <laughs> he just kept going. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's insane. It's so fun, so much fun to watch. His his season average is up to a two thirty nine. <clears throat> And uh, the last time we did like a prospect kind of overview, which was really not that long ago, I think it was maybe two months ago or so, like right after. Well, it might have yeah. been a little more than that, but he was hitting like one. I think it was the like end of June or something. Yeah, he was hitting like one. He was hitting like two oh something, maybe two weeks yeah. ago. Like it's it's insane the the progress he's made and just how fast he's risen. You know his numbers. It's, it's awesome. And honestly, like I've <clears throat> I bought a M- MILB TV because just I wanted to watch more minor league games, especially since Sixto was sometimes on with uh, Clearwater. And when it, when I got it, it was was still with Lakewood. But um, watching JP bat, I don't want to put like unrealistic unrealistic expectations for him because like I don't. Who knows if he's actually going to be like this guy. But the dude looks like Chase Utley when he's batting. Like, he is a carbon I, copy of what I, I don't, Chase looked I don't like when he was at bat. Like, it's it's crazy how similar those two are. But, uh... Yeah, I mean, it's... Yeah. The guy is... I don't know. He's something... <coughs> whatever whatever clicked. I mean... I, all right, I'm not going to take, I'm not going to, oh, okay, hang on real quick. So one month ago, on Ju, or, uh, sorry, August, or July 13th, he was hitting 216, and a month later, he's hitting pretty much 240. He's risen, in, he's risen his on base up to almost 350. Um, his slug is now a, 
I, I want to say like a 4 or something. Just as a low 4s, maybe? Yeah, 408. Um, not including today, so maybe it went down a Might point or whatever. Up. I forget what he... Um, he, he only singled today. He only singled with a, uh, oh, okay. with a run scored and a walk, so, he, you know, pretty trash day at the plate, but... <laughs> yeah, it, it really... I mean, really, Dude. it's crazy. Like, he... I'm not going to take too much credit for this. Um, let me just go real quick. So since, obviously since that injury, um, he's been on fire. But I, tw I tweeted something on July tw or uh, June 21st. And if you go date, if you date everything from June 22nd on, and he's hitting like 293 with like a 400 on base. So It's, it might be Jared. It might be me. Jared, you just... You it's weird because I was at the game on <clears throat> on June 10th. The last game that he played for those 10 days, I was at that game. He went 2 for 5 with a run scored. Right? And ever since then, he's hitting this. Like, he's doing this. So... And then I tweeted that... You injured him, and then but I also fixed him at the well, same time. Well, I didn't injure him. I didn't <laughs> injure him. I kind of just... I, I suggested that he take a break for 10 days. Then oh okay there we go yeah look at him now <laughs> he's magically back to normal mm -hmm. I mean he's he's reaching the point where he's almost back to what he was doing with uh, Reading last year pretty much yeah like it's he's almost getting to that like two fifty two sixty range which I if he keeps this up which I think he will he's gonna be at that like, if he finishes the year if he hitter. finishes this year above a two like fifty two sixty average that that's insane because when you go from yeah. hitting barely above two you're hitting in the two teens on you know july 13th or whatever and now you're a month later hitting 240 and you figure that's we're late in the season and to raise your batting average more than 20 yeah. points like that's remarkable so we could be seeing him in well, we're... two and a half weeks at this point like it's crazy to think but we can be I mean, I think we definitely see him at some point. Like, he's oh, yeah. going to make yeah. his debut yeah. just because, yeah. he, like you said, or, um, it might have been last episode or a few episodes ago, but, like, they have to put him on the 40-man just to avoid the Rule 5 draft. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're going to put him on the 40-man, you might as well just bring him up. Like, what's the harm? Yeah, there's only 39 on right anywhere, now. There's so. only 39 on the 40-man right now, so. Yeah, so they... And you got to figure they'll be making some kind of moves just to bring up a guy like JP or... I don't... They probably won't bring up Kingery. No. Because I, they don't, I don't have to. So. No, I but, don't think so. Yeah. But JP, like... His vision is all... His, has been Major League ready for the past, like, two years now. Like, he's been ready. It's just the timing and the hitting, his average and all that. That's just what's needed work. Yep. And it looks like he's fixed it. Hopefully it's... You know, it stays like this. Hopefully he can just keep this going. But, uh... Yeah, JP's on fire. Uh, <laughs> a guy that is not on fire, though, Dylan Cousins has been... Oh, boy. Um, yeah. So, remember last year when Dylan Cousins hit all those home runs and everyone was like, bring him up to the majors, he's ready. Yeah. How, how dumb do you look right about <laughs> now? <laughs> because he's... This is the Redding effect. This is the Darren Ruff effect. This is what happens to people who are really good in Reading, and then, you know, you, you bump them up and you kind of see what they actually are. I don't think Dylan Cousins is, like, this bad. No. Like, I think he's better than Absolutely. what yeah. he's doing right now, but <laughs> but this is a very... Bad stretch. Very cold streak for <laughs> Dylan. Very. Uh, he's, his average on the season is down to 218. Uh, OBP <clears throat> of 306. It's just not good. Like, yeah. his last 28 days, he's hitting 134 with only one homer, no doubles, no triples. His slug is at a 171. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Um, even over his last 90 days, 216, 312 OBP, 404 slug, like, it's it's not good. It, he's... Yeah. He struck out in... I, I don't... 20-something straight games, like... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's he struck out four times earlier in uh July. He struck out and that's the thing, when he strikes out, it's not even just like it's one time a lot of the time. It's multiple three, strikeouts yeah. in a game. 
Had golden sombrero uh, a couple weeks back. He, we went on a stretch where he he struck out at least twice in like six or seven out of eight games. Like he, he struck out three times, twice, four, two, two, then one, then two, then three. Like it, yeah. He, yeah. He, he's uh he's definitely um he's going through it right now. But he's only twenty. I mean he's only twenty three. He's huge. He's like six whatever he is. Yeah. And he just turned twenty. He has all the tools. He just turned twenty three in May, at the end of May, um, and he's what six six two forty or two whatever fifty is. Um, I don't know. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm really hoping that he he could figure it out because his, his he's basically you know Aaron Judge esque if he could get to his ceiling, but. The problem with that is uh, he doesn't walk as much as a judge. I mean, granted, he has walked, like, what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. He's walked, like, seven or eight times in August already, which isn't too bad. But the problem is he's struck out, like, 20-something times. So, um, Yeah. Yeah. I, if he could just cut down the strikeouts, he'd be fine. Yeah. If, like, that's the thing. Like, if he just... Yeah, I, I mean, sure, he's going to strike out a ton. It's just who he is. But if he could go, yeah. you know, if he can get stretches to where he's striking out maybe... Like, look right now. Like, Aaron Judge, he struck out in, like, 28 straight games or something like that for the Yankees. And he's still... I mean, he's he's really struggling in the second half. Um, believe me, I have him on my fantasy team, I would know. But he... Yeah. <laughs> like, he... He's... Yeah, Judge is, is really struggling right now. That's mainly because, you know, the league has kind of figured him out. I mean, he's, if you strike him out, which he's very prone of, um, and you don't walk him, he's not gonna... He's not gonna be able to hurt you that much. So, um... I mean, Cousins, man, if he, I mean, it's a big if here. If he could, next year, if he starts out in AAA, which he most likely will be, um, and then you kind of see him maybe progress. I, I, I think he might get a, a September call-up this year um, because he's already on the 40, man, so we don't have to worry about that. And, you know, mm-hmm. maybe a major league strike zone will help him, like Alfaro, because, you know, obviously you've seen Alfaro come up. And he, he's, I mean, he's played pretty well. I mean, he's, you know, he's in whatever, three, yeah, he's something been... through, you know, four games or whatever it is. But, I mean, still, like, you kind of tell pitches that he he's taking now, he would also take in, in the minor leagues, but he's actually, you know, like, getting calls. And he's not, he's only struck out four yeah. times so far um, in three games. Well, I mean, only four and three, but, you know, still, he's, he's not... He's not jumping at pitches, so maybe a major league strike zone will be will be bliss for uh, for Dylan Cousins too. But you, you you only can kind of wait and see because they could still make the playoffs down in Lehigh. Um, I mean, it's not it's not really a given now because you know half their half their opening day lineup is in Philly now. But um, yeah, pretty much. I mean, losing Hoskins. Is oh yeah, that's a, that's a blow. Bit of a blow. You got to uh, figure if. If they end up deciding to call up JP at like the beginning of September, um, you know, <laughs> you could be screwed. losing him there. But you know they'll still have um, maybe I don't know Kingery. But yeah, it's it, it's gonna be um, yeah Leah will be weird because it was so much fun to watch him for the first whatever six months or four months of the year. But now it's like well, who else? Who is left? Like who who do you have left? So. Oh yeah, I be- when I watch the Lehigh games, I'm basically just like, okay, let me just watch JP and King Green. That's literally and then what I do. Turn to the I literally don't then, like. I just yeah. go on my phone on the MLB, the MILB app and just sit there on game day when King Green and, and Crawford come up, and then I just like try to remember like periodically, like every like 30, 40, 30 yeah. so minutes, just be like, okay, maybe now he's gonna be back up, so I'll check it. But yeah. <laughs> exactly, it's. Those are like the only two you kind of yeah. Get there's not that much to watch, yeah. pretty much. Uh, but yeah, so hopefully Dylan Cousins can just get out of this funk that he's in, and we'll see what happens in September. Like you said, he's on the forty man, so I definitely can imagine he gets called up, especially if Lehigh doesn't go far in the playoffs, which they might not. If yeah, let me check there, uh, guys like JP get check. called up. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, let me just... I think they're, like, two games out or something. Let me see. It's, they're, um, so right th- now, their division is tough. Yeah, so right now they are 69 and 52. Um, they are eight games behind uh, the Scranton Wilkes Bay Rail Riders for first in the Isle North. Um, they have... Um, let me see here. So, 
Yeah, so they're probably not going to win the division unless they just like, heat up. Um, the wild yeah. card, they are currently tied with Rochester for the wild card lead. And so the what are the playoff procedures? Okay, so um, I don't even know how the. Uh, I, I think there's like barely. Yeah, I think like three teams from the IL make the playoffs, or like four teams from the IL make the playoffs. Like It's like the three division winners and one wild card team, I believe. So. Oh, that's weird. Yeah. yeah. Minor league playoffs are weird. Yeah. I, I'm honestly like I kind like for as much as I want to see them like go and win in the playoffs or whatever, I kind of don't want them to make the playoffs so like we can see like JP appears. Yeah. And even honestly, it might even help Cousins like from a just a mental standpoint, like give give him some confidence if he gets called up, and then mm -hmm. see what happens there. But yeah. Uh. Yeah, we'll see what happens. Uh, definitely Lehigh is going to have a tough time in the playoffs, especially if they do call up JP mm -hmm. and Cousins, but we'll see what happens. Uh, so, our uh, typical uh, Sixto prize, six our update. prize possession. Yeah, exactly. We need to protect him. Uh, he made his... Yeah. <laughs> he made his uh, second start with the uh, Clearwater Threshers. He won six innings. Man, he has a weird of starts. He went six innings, gave up six hits, three earned runs, only walked one, struck out four, uh, had 72 pitches, and 50 of them were strikes. So, yeah, I... like, he's, and there's no, um, they only, only gave up one double, no triples, no home runs or anything. So he's just getting singled to death. Pretty much. Like, that's basically just the theme of his yeah. starts. Yeah, I mean, he's only given uh, up one, he only gave up, well, he's given up a double in each of his starts. <clears throat> and, yeah, that's it. Like, he hasn't given <laughs> up any, yeah, no home runs, he hasn't given up a triple, like Kyle said. Um, yeah, basically singles. He's, he, he's walked one person in 12 innings. Um, he's 19 years old, high A, somehow, the guy is still, I mean, like, his, you know, he's, he's still doing fine. I mean, he's really not that bad of a, a sat line yeah, for a 19 year old in, in high A so I don't know we, we're just gonna have, obviously have to wait and see with him um I bet you I bet you coming up here soon I I think honestly part of the reason why they they bumped him to Clearwater um was the fact that they don't really expect them to make the playoffs because of uh well their offense isn't the greatest besides maybe like Cornelius Randolph yeah. Wilson Garcia but like other than that like their their offense is pretty bad um so they probably don't expect them to make the playoffs. So they probably gave him a bump there to kind of just, you know, finish out the year there. I honestly would not be shocked if they gave him a, a Reading start in the playoffs because Reading will probably make the playoffs um, unless they just yeah. blow up at the end of the season. Um, but I, that they probably won't do that unless they want to get him like a to a certain innings limit and he doesn't get there in uh, and he doesn't get there in. Uh, single A. Clear water. But, uh, yeah, yeah I, I don't know. Like, Reading right now is... Let's see. They are... Um, they're, well, they're 16 and a half out of first, but that's that's Trenton. Uh, Trenton's like 80 and 40. So That's the Yankees, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, they're 78 and yeah, 40 right now. Yeah, they're really good. Um, but if Reading was in the other Eastern League division, they'd be in first. So... That it, the two so. te the two teams ahead of them, Trenton and uh, Binghamton, are they're pretty good. Um, so they'll probably make the playoffs, I would assume, because I I think probably what you figure maybe four or six teams make it there, and they're in the top four right now. They're definitely in the top six. So, um, yeah. Yeah, he might get called up just for like a start. Like you said, if he doesn't meet the innings limit or whatever, or yeah, they just want to see like what he could do or something. Just what he can do against yeah. them. Yeah, but uh. Yeah, so I wouldn't be worried about Sixto having not the greatest starts, just because if you if a pitcher is going to give up hits, it's probably the best that he's giving up singles mm -hmm. and not uh, extra bases. Obviously, fixes. singles are yeah, singles are and, when you know like okay, if I just you know if this ball is two inches you know left, right, up, down, whatever, um, it's a it's a it's roll over ground ball to first, third, short, whatever. And when you're you know when you're high liners and you have guys. Um, that we have, because a lot of our, you know, a lot of our uh, middle infielders and infielders in general, a lot of our players in general are 
good defenders. So when you have these guys who are going to make plays and you just need a, a ball another inch or two out in whatever, uh, you're going to get it. And he's 19. And the biggest thing for me is that he's not throwing a ton of pitches. He's only thrown – I mean, he's 12, he's thrown 12 innings and his – He's what? Well, yeah, he's thrown. He threw what? Seventy-two pitches, and then he threw. Um, or sorry, well, yeah, seventy-two and eighty-three, um, which, you know, I don't know how, given the fact that he's given up eight runs. Um, but he's, he hasn't walked. He's walked one person, um, and that's 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 pretty much the biggest thing for me. You know, as long as he keeps the pitch count yeah. relatively low. Um, and he keeps the walks low and the strikeouts. I mean, he doesn't have to strike out 15 a game, um, but if you can keep him, you know, whatever, nah, I, I'm fine. Like it's it's really not b- b- bothering me too yeah. much. He'll, he'll figure it out. I have, I have confidence. Yeah, definitely. And I I don't think anyone's really worried about six. So it's just, you know, and singles sometimes are just luck anyway. You can't even put too much into it because they could just be blue pits that are falling in and just everything's finding a gap because that's just it's sometimes what happens it's baseball yeah sometimes you just get a little bit unlucky as michael franco would definitely know this year and uh reese hoskins would know and that's a good segue segue actually uh hoskins got his first mlb hit today thank fucking god because it was so annoying (laughs) i saw a thing i was just like i saw a thing he um he had the longest uh hitless streak to open up his career um, for Phillies, for a Philly player, um, since I think it was Chris Coast back in like '06 or something like that. Oh, poor Chris Coast. <laughs> or whenever Chris Coast came up. Uh, but, yeah. It was, yeah, yeah. '06. <clears throat> yeah, it was. It was tough, especially because he had. Okay, for one, poor Reese Hoskins that he had to come up with like men in scoring position like every single time. Like that's so much pressure to put on a guy in his like his first three games in the big leagues. Mm-hmm. But uh. He had so many hard hit balls. Balls that just didn't find a hole. Uh, his vision was good basically the entire series. Yeah. Like he, the game on the twelfth, he had like one pretty bad at bat with the bases loaded. I think where he was just like you, you could tell he was just overthinking it. Like he was pushing himself too hard. But uh, yeah, got his first hit today. Had also got an RBI earlier on a uh, fielder's choice. Um. Honestly, I, there's no reason to even be worried about him. It's He's four games or whatever into his MLB career. His plate vision and discipline have been fine, really yeah. good already. So it's I think he just needed the first one, just get it out of the way, and now he can just kind of go do what he was doing in AAA. Yeah, like they – like the, <laughs> the fact that um, – and I must – I must I, I got to commend uh, Pete McCannon on this for sure because today he hit – um, Hoskins and Nick Williams back to back, which um, is it's crazy because in the I forget what inning it was, but they literally like I think I forget if Hoskins has got had gotten on base already or not. Um, that that at bat I forget if he walked or if that w- that was when he got his hit. No, it wasn't when he got his hit. But I forget if he walked that time. But they legitimately pitched around Nick Williams yeah. to get to <laughs> Michael Franco. Like you know how how good your rookies are in Hoskins and Williams when you put them back to back and they basically pitch around them try to get them to you know hit a weak grounder and you know Nick Williams eventually walked to basically get to Michael Front like that's like it shows like it shows how these two guys are all, like they're they've been in the big leagues for a combined like not even 40 games yet and they're already getting pitched around so um just imagine when they're like reach their full potential oh, yeah like it's GG to the NL. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. So, Reese got his first hit today. Thank fucking God. Yeah. It's just so glad they got it out of the way. It's off his shoulders. Yeah. It it's, off his, uh, it's off his shoulders. Now we just... Once he... Uh, Can we relax? Much, yeah. Just, That's all... You, uh, when you're 24 years old and, you know, coming into... Uh, and, you know, he really couldn't have come up at, like, a more pressure situation because you figure... You know, alumni weekend, you, they bring him up. There's all these Phillies legends around you. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's probably... Oh, and your first start is against Jacob DeGrom. Yeah, it's probably the most... Well, at least, you know, with you know with how the cur- Philly, the, uh, the Phillies currently are, you know, they're not that great. So the attendance isn't going to be that high, you know, 
obviously. But you figure you're coming up during the weekend where there's probably going to be the most attendance at Citizens Bank Park all year, maybe aside from aside from opening day or opening, opening weekend. Day. Yeah. Um, maybe the last game of the year. But other than that, yeah, like this is the weekend where you know you're going to get the most attendance and you know he came up and once he got that once he gets that first hit and uh you know he did obviously today um it's just at that point you just have to you know watch his plate plate discipline um you know obviously he's gonna need to probably go for extra bases at points um but i personally as long as he you know keeps his plate appearance uh, or plate approach sorry as long as he keeps his plate approach, you know, he stays quiet at the plate. Because right now he has a 3-4 to four walk to strikeout ratio, um, which is good, obviously. Um, if he just keeps that, you know, if he keeps... Obviously, it's not going to be a 3-4 to four walk to strikeout ratio. That's probably just unsustainable for a guy like him. Um, yeah. But if he could just, you know, if he could keep his approach, um, I, I'm, I think, you know, this experiment... Not experiment, this promotion is, is pretty much a win, so yeah. Definitely. I think we all kind of know what we think Reese Hoskins is going to be. It's just it's just good to have him up here. It's He deserved it like mid-season, so. Yep. Uh, yeah, so that is basically about it. Basically for now, yeah, we're just the, waiting for uh, for the for the inevitable JP, or, well, JP, Scott Kinger, yeah. JP Crawford, <laughs> Nick Williams, Reese Hoskins, yeah. the Jorge Alfaro lineup. And if, if that happens... This season is a success. Absolutely. And, I mean, it's going to happen next year, most likely, so... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, that's about it for Phillies things. Uh, unless you have anything else to add, but... No, that's, that's it. Alright, so, obviously, since I intro this week, uh, I have the hot take. I just want to talk about a certain pitcher here. Or, actually, two pitchers. So, first, I'm going to give the stats of this guy who uh, has been in the MLB for six years now and is pretty pretty widely respected around the league. Like, this guy's a pretty good pitcher. I'm just going to read off the stats from his first two seasons in the big leagues. Uh, his rookie year went 3-8 and eight with a 5.27 ERA, a 1.547 whip. Uh, the next year he went 6-10 and 10 with a 5.15 ERA. Uh, 1.536 whip. So, and then the following year, went 12-9, 2 .93 ERA. Following year, he went, he won 20 games and won the Cy Young. Do you know who I'm talking about? Um, if he's in the, uh, the NL, then, um, well, I don't, I, honestly, maybe, I don't know, Jake Arrieta or something? I don't even know. Not AL. AL? Um, I think AL West. Ale West. Um, oh, is it Keichel? Yep. So, just keep those stats in mind, and then just keep that in mind, and then think about Nick Pavetta's start this season. So, okay, he's got a 6.09 ERA, but only a 1.455 whip, which is lower than what Keichel's was. And then Vince Velasquez. His uh, basically rookie year last year, 4.12 ERA, 1.328 whip. This year, obviously, it's gotten worse. He's got a 5.13 ERA and then 1.5 whip, but also there's injury things with that, too. So, um, just The point of this is, if you give up on every single young pitcher, like two years into their career, you never get a Dallas Keuchel who goes on to win a Cy Young. You never get a Jake Arrieta. You never get... Even a Clayton Kershaw. Like, Clayton Kershaw didn't have the best rookie season, but now he's Clayton Kershaw. Like, these people who are, like, so obsessed with, you know, I want good pitchers right away. Like, we need, we need these guys to be aces right away. That's just not how it works. No one is an ace right away. And if they are, they're probably not actually that good. Like, Francisco Liriano, that in his rookie season, looked, like, had a, almost an under 2 ERA. And now look where Liriano is. Mm -hmm. Like, it's... Good starts don't always mean continued success. I mean, f for fuck's sakes, Tyler Cloyd had, like, a half-decent 
start yeah. to his major league career, <laughs> and we don't even know who Tyler Cloyd, like where he is in life anymore. So, a bad start doesn't equal a bad career, just like a good start doesn't equal a good career. It's as simple as that. <clears throat> and I'm just so tired of seeing people like, oh, run Nick Pavetta out of town, run Vince Velasquez out of town, when you have no idea if these guys are going to amount to anything. And especially for guys like Pavetta and Velasquez, who have ridiculously good fastballs, mm -hmm. if they can just figure out their secondary pitches, just even one secondary pitch, like they are going to be really good. It's just the matter of if they can do it. And I'm not even saying that Nick Pavetta and Vince Velasquez are going to be really good pitchers. <clears throat> But you can't just give up on every single goddamn pitcher. <laughs> yeah. Like, you got to hold on to some and just hope. Like, again, like Dallas Keuchel, he had two horrific seasons. Like, he had back-to-back -back seasons with over a 5 ERA. And then he had 2.93, and then a 2.48. Struggled in 2016, but now he's back down to a 2.87. Like, I don't know. I just, I'm just so tired of seeing people give up on guys. Yep. Like, the instant that they get called up, just because they're not studs right away. Like, Chase Utley wasn't a fucking all-star right away. The dude batted, like, 230 or something in his rookie year, and then, like, 260 or something in his following season. So, like, just chill out, people. Yeah. I mean, you look at, you know, you look at Pavetta and, and Velasquez, and like you said, they both have really good fastballs, and pretty much the only thing that has really hurt them this year has been the home run. Um, and, you know, obviously, yeah, exactly. you know, Velasquez more than Pavetta, but they still have both, you know, they've both struggled with command issues, obviously, Velasquez, um, other than that seven-inning start, and I believe he had a six-inning start earlier this year. Um, you know, other than those two starts, really, he's kind of struggled with his command. Um, Pavetta, at times, has struggled with his command. He's, you know, whatever, not as bad as Velasquez has, um, but still, he, he has a little bit. And... Um, so you see, you know, these two guys, and if they, like Kyle said, if they, you know, could figure out one secondary pitch, right, and, you know, figure out their command issues, which really command in the MLB is probably the easiest kind of thing to figure out because control, you either have it or you don't, right, but command of the strike zone is a lot more important, and as you kind of age and you see hitters more, you gotta, you gotta remember, you know, Nick Pavetta is in, he's, what, 15 starts into his career? Um, I mean, hell, if we, if we judged Aaron Nola on his, well, I mean, not, not necessarily his first 15 starts, but his, you know, his second 15 starts, you know, his early 2016, or, well, mid-2016 starts, you know, we'd, we'd be, you know, we'd, we'd be grading the guy as a bust, and look at him now, he's been you know, the top two pitcher in all of baseball pretty much the last two months, right? So, I mean, if, if you give up on these guys already, um, it just, it just really makes no sense. And even, you know, even if you don't give up on them and they, you know, they go on and they don't 100% figure it out and they can't stick in the rotation, they still both have, you know, a, a potential future in the bullpen because they both have good fastballs. Yeah. Um, I mean, Velasquez, if, if he throws <laughs> his his curve or whatever he has slider if he throws it for you know strikes it's a it's a pretty good pitch he just has to you know figure out um consistency with it and same with pavetta he just hangs a, a few curve balls here and there and he, and they get and they punish him um but if he could figure out that command then it's you know th those two guys are viable bullpen options because they throw like velasquez could throw 97 uh pavetta could throw you know 96 97 probably so you know and once these guys have um once these guys have, you know, time to, to kind of iron things out, then maybe um, you could kind of start giving up on them as starters at least. But like I said, they both do have, you know, decent bullpen future potential. So you can't really give them up, give up on them too much. Um, and, and and I don't really think there is any reason to. So you know, obviously we'll just have to wait and see, like all young players. But uh, but yeah, you just gotta have confidence in them. Yep. And. Yeah, just the theme of this is just don't give up on players right away because you just miss out on some people then. And, again, like, if they don't work out, like Jared said, you can put them in the bullpen. And, worst case scenario, they just don't work. Like, they just don't have a place on the team. 
and oh, s- sorry for us, Sixo Sanchez replaces one of them. Yeah. <laughs> Franklin Franklin Killame replaces one of them. Adonis oh, Medina. Poor us. Yeah. Some. Like, yeah. Sir Anthony yeah. Dominguez. Like, there's so yeah, many. Have, the bullpen depth, it's, or the, the, the prospect depth um, at starting pitching is is really good. Um, and, you know, we have guys in AAA right now. You know, your your Thompson. Well, obviously, Jake Thompson, he showed he show, he showed a few good starts. But, you know, other than that, he's, he's kind of been inconsistent. Um, lively. But he's He was pretty good in the MLB, but he's been ass since going back to AAA. Um, which is weird, um, you know. Eshelman. Yeah, who knows that that's coaching? Yeah, or Eshelman. Something, but... Like it's, it's just a you, you just gotta wait with them, and the the good news is, um, the Phillies kind of timeline for contention, like true contention, not you know, oh uh, you might be in wild card contention this year. No, like true wild card contention is probably about twenty 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 one or so. Um, so. And right there is when your your guys, you know, your Kilome. Well, Kilome could honestly be up at the end of next year if they wanted to, um, but he'll probably be in the starting yeah. rotation to begin 2019. Um, Sixto, he could be called up end of 2019, beginning of 2020. Same with uh, well, Medina. He'll probably be a little bit around. He'll he'll probably be between the two of them, um, even though he's lower than Sixto right now. It's just that Sixto is obviously younger and whatever. But um, yeah, Medina, he'll probably be. Around the time that that Kilame or Sixto is up, around that time, um, Dominguez same time. Um, yeah, I mean the right there you have four guys pretty much in Kilame, Sanchez, Medina, and Dominguez who they're pretty much all ace. You know, absolute absolute ceiling ace um, with Sixto obviously as like like best pitcher in baseball potential the ace. Yeah. Um, <laughs> with the other three being you know if the everything works out ace if not everything works out but most does you know number two number three and if you know most and if some stuff works but you know like important stuff doesn't then oh too bad you know you got you know 97 98 with good secondary pitches coming out of the bullpen like it, like really those guys are going to be key and uh and if you if you're not patient with them then you're not gonna have a good time. So, yeah, just yeah. Basically, moral of the story: just be patient. I mean, it's not that hard. Oh, but it is. It's very hard for Phillies fans mm-hmm. because they expect you know Roy Halladay, Cole Hamels, Chase Utley, Ryan Howard out of guys right away. Yeah. Because, which I I don't know. The, the fan I love Phillies fans, but sometimes I just want to punch them in the face. Oh yeah, <laughs> like, absolutely. Sometimes. Absolutely. <laughs> sometimes. But uh. Yeah, so that's pretty much it. Uh, Phillies, they're getting, like, I, Phillies are such in a weird spot right now because, like, there's a lot of good things happening, but they're also still losing. Yeah, you see, so the things that are happening, the good things that are happening are the important things. So, like, you're, you know, you're Arjubli, you're Williams, yeah, you're Alfaro, you're, I mean, Hoskins, you know, has been decent. Um, you know, your minor league guys who are lighting it up. Th- those things that are happening, you know, those things, the good things that are happening are the important things. Everything else that's happening bad, you know, like, yeah. you know, Cameron Rupp coming down to earth again and being Cameron Rupp. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Tommy that's Joseph's like we'll not doing that well. Tommy jo- you know, what we expect. Yeah, basically, like, all the stuff that's happening that's bad is what we kind of expect it to be bad. And everything that's happening that's good is what you need to be good. So, yeah. Pretty much. So, uh, that about wraps it up for the 27th episode of the Drive Podcast. Uh, next week... Uh, let's see if, well, that'll be, yeah, we'll be wrapping up the Eagles Mm -hmm. second, uh, preseason game. Uh, hopefully we'll have more, uh, JP hot streaks and Nola hot streak and Oduble, but, uh, yeah, that'll probably be it again. I don't think that we'll have really any Sixers things. Unless something pops up. Maybe a Jaleel local for trade. I highly doubt it though. Ah, please, (laughs) please, dear Lord, please. But, uh, <laughs> Actually, no. I hope it. I hope Barring that doesn't that. happen because I I have something that I wrote for that. But you know. That, oh. Yeah. Well, all right. <laughs> at least well, at uh, least make make it till like a month, and then you can trade them. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Just just wait till your thing is yep. out, and then that's whatever. But uh, yeah. That about wraps up the twenty seventh episode. Uh, be sure to like and subscribe, and uh, we will see yep. you guys next Thank week. Thank you for listening. Peace out.